a lot of things, I think so much in life is timing. And if you really get in touch with your gut feeling and you feel like you have good intuition on things happening at the right time, so much is about one, being in the right place at the right time, being around the right people at the right time, and then making the right decisions at the right time. The business got to a point where it was cash flow positive and I was able to. So when, when the consumers for the VPN came to you and they sat there and said, hey, we want to pay you in Bitcoin, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that's how, that's how it started. Most businesses back then would be like, no, nah, you could pay me in the money. I, I want the money. What made you decide to say yes on something you had no clue about and, and just dive deep into it? Yeah, I think it, it, it has to do with my background, being really receptive to things that were changing at a very rapid clip on the internet. And I'm really, I consider myself, I'm a, mille, a millennial, but um, for as long as I can remember, I've had a high speed inter internet connection. I kind of missed the whole dial up phase thanks to my father who was a tech nerd. And we used to have a T1 line at home just coming in and, and I was always able to spend time on the internet. When I grew up, there was no concept of screen time in the early 90s. So I got to spend as much time as I wanted with DOS operating systems, playing Duke Nukem, learning how to build early computer applications, building motherboards with my father. I got really into the hardware. We had static electricity strips all over the air hockey table in the basement where we built these motherboards on top of. Um, I learned how to program, learned how to build early web pages. Um, and then I got really into uh, the economies around MMORPGs, massive multiplayer online role-playing games in the late 90s, early 2000s. So there were these browser-based games, games like runescape.com. And I got into a lot of trouble for this. I was probably 11, 12 years old. I ended up creating... Um, a business uh, where uh, we would sell RuneScape gold points. This is a version of digital currency, a version of digital money, uh, digital currency before cryptocurrency, if you will, um, where I took RuneScape gold points outside of the game RuneScape and started selling them on places like eBay and then my own website, eventually runemint.com. I also started buying RuneScape gold points at a very, you know, um, at a very nice um, a discount to what I was selling them for. I'd, I'd pay about $10 per million RuneScape gold points. We'd sell them for between $25 and $30. Um, and we we're making a handsome profit. Apparently that's called market making. And in the gaming world, that's called RWT. Uh, I was 11, 12 years old at the time and had no idea, uh, but I was making thousands of dollars per day profit. Um, and this went on for several months until I quite literally got uh, suit by Jagex Limited, the multi-billion dollar game company uh, behind RuneScape. And uh, I, you know, I share that story because it, it, you can see how this would have a big impact on an 11 year old's life, right? I mean, I, I loved this game. Uh, my brother was one of the best players in the world. He was much better than me. I was just the business guy that had this idea of commercializing the currency and the characters and things of that nature. Um, and it was incredibly emotional. I was in tears. I was heartbroken. I'd spent so much time building this up. And I put so much thought into this business. I had this entire operation where we had these decoy characters. So our real characters were never caught, but we'd deliver the goal to the decoy characters, to the customer who purchased it. We'd meet them in a particular map or in a particular world, and we'd deliver the coins to them. Every, upon buying, we would take your email, your name, and your... Um, uh, your character, your username uh, in the game. And we would go meet up with you and transfer you the money. And everyone was happy and everyone loved it. Uh, and uh, that was emotional. And I, I really hated that a multi-billion dollar tech conglomerate game company had control over the intellectual property behind a currency. That's what they got me on. They got me on not real world trading because I hadn't broken any federal laws, but I was in violation of- Trademark. Uh, a trademark, trademark infringement, their intellectual property. So really bad. Um, and this is a decade before Bitcoin. So fast forward a decade, and now I'm learning about Bitcoin in 2012. Um, and then customers start emailing us, asking us to take it in 2013 um, at a pretty fast clip. Um, this is around like Edward Snowden, Prism Leaks, Edward Snowden, if you remember, tells the whole world that your government spies on us. You know, not a big surprise for those that have been paying attention, but for most of the world, totally appalled. Our messages are being read, your Facebook Messenger, your WhatsApp, your 
iMessage, you have no privacy, your emails are being um, indexed and uh, people started getting paranoid in v VPN sales. From the consumer perspective, the VPN industry was always enterprise focused. If you worked at JP Morgan, if you worked at Citi, if you worked at a large financial institution, you were always forced to log in with a VPN to the corporate servers when you work from home. Consumers never bought VPNs really, especially not American consumers. It was mostly like British people who were living outside the UK who wanted to access um, the internet as if they were still in the UK and then the American expat community. But American consumers at home buying VPNs, man, that exploded. And then people wanted to pay us in an anonymous payment method. So they started paying us in Bitcoin. Um, and you know, who was I to say no? At that point, the business was stable. We had enough uh, monthly recurring revenue from the credit card proceeds and the PayPal proceeds. So those were our two biggest payment methods, credit cards and PayPal. Um, so, you know, if every fifth customer, or every, you know, eighth customer paid us in Bitcoin, you know, what did we care? It's funny, we didn't even know what to do with it. It just started piling up in this wallet. We'd get between half a Bitcoin and a full Bitcoin every single time someone purchased our annual plan. And Jason, you know, you'll fall off your chair when I say this, but we hated when people paid us in Bitcoin. We really didn't like it because our business was all predicated on lifetime value of a customer. So with a credit card and PayPal, you can monthly recur the charge and an annual customer, you could do it. So we learned really quickly. We, we banned people from paying us monthly in Bitcoin because we almost never could get them to pay the next month because we mm. literally had to email them, email yeah. them, pay, pay, pay. Um, and we made you either buy the annual plan or pay for two years up front. Uh, so those people paid in Bitcoin. Uh, and, uh, but they, they wouldn't recur, whereas someone on a credit card would just recur for the next year, and that, and that was great, and they had like multi-year lifetime value. As it turns out, you know, the people who paid us in Bitcoin ended up paying what is today $40,000 for a one-year <laughs> VPN subscription that should have cost, you know, $100. Yeah. And, uh, you know, who would have thought? I've actually made more money on that Bitcoin than I have, uh, you know, selling the business, um, which we sold in 2017. It's now part of a publicly traded company called uh, Ziff Davis. They used to be called J2 Global. They're now Ziff Davis. Um, and So, uh, so how do you know? Because oh, this is very interesting. 2013, you start getting paid in this, you start accumulating it. Okay, over the last decade, you're seeing like, you know, the price of Bitcoin go up and up and up. Right now, it's crazy to think, you know, 40,000 or, or whatever, or 50,000. But what made you decide to hold on? Like what, what made you like, just say, I'm yeah. gonna hold on and not, and not cash all out at, let's say, you know, when it, when it rose to a thousand dollars. I think I would have to say that it was, it, I'll go back to the answer on serendipity, right? A lot of things, I think so much in life is timing. And if you really get in touch with your gut feeling and you feel like you have good intuition on, you know, things happening at the right time, so much is about one, being in the right place at the right time, being around the right people at the right time, and then making the right decisions at the right time for, you know, the business got to a point where it was cash flow positive and I was able to draw a salary. I had raised no venture capital to start this business. I was funding everything on a credit card. They got to a point where it was the first time I could start to take money out of the business. So the business is making money. There's revenue coming in and now it's starting to scale exponentially because you kind of forget about the early customers. They start to recur. Then the new customers start to come in and wow, like things are really compounding. Monthly recurring SaaS businesses, I love them. Like they're just, they're great. And it's a great business. So here's this, this Bitcoin pile up, but Bitcoin's floating between 400, 500, maybe pops up to a thousand and then kind of like trends back down. Um, when we got acquired in 2017, I had a liquidity event. I had a buyout. I'm objectively wealthy by any standard for anyone, any age. I'm 27 years old. And I, uh, I, I didn't need to sell cryptocurrency. I didn't need to sell Bitcoin. At the time we got acquired, Bitcoin was about $800, 800 to $1,000. So I have cash, I have this Bitcoin. And what I decided to do at that point is again, just pure serendipitous timing. Having liquidity in February of 2017, I started pouring cash into Ethereum around seven to $12. I started buying Litecoin at $4. I started looking at, okay, there's more than just Bitcoin. And um, I didn't have an earnout. It was a one-time uh, exit. The company um, that uh, Buffered's now part of, it was rolled into a software called Encrypt.me. So they collapsed the brand. There's no more Buffered VPN anymore, which is kind of sad. 
uh, because it was my baby and I love that brand. Um, but it's now part of encrypt.me. And then they own a bunch of other VPN brands. They were buying up VPN brands, consolidating them. They didn't need a CEO. They didn't need me. They wanted the engineers. They wanted the customer support team. They wanted, you know, the payment processing, but they didn't need, they didn't need me. Um, so I got to wipe my hands clean of it and I had nothing to do except read blockchain white papers. So I start, you know, I start deploying capital in the space. I did every ICO in 2017. I'm not kidding. Every initial coin offering and you couldn't lose money, man. I mean, a lot of the projects don't exist anymore, but I still made 20 times the capital I put in from, from investing. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was fast money. It wasn't feeling good. No one was building anything of value. Um, and that led me to my next project, which uh, I, I started with some partners in, in the summer of 2017. That's when I um, decided to stop sitting passively and deploying capital. I was actually quite depressed during this period, in full disclosure, um, which I know may sound strange to some of your listeners. I'm wealthy. I have everything I thought I've ever wanted, right? You have lots of zeros in my bank account. Um, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't have something to wake up for. And it was during that time I realized what I really loved wasn't the exit. I wasn't really working for the exit. I really loved the process of waking up every day and sucking at something and getting better at it, right? That could be like going to a CrossFit gym and getting like healthier. That could be just like learning a new skill or taking a new class or like gaining knowledge. But for me, it was starting a business from scratch. It was waking up every day and working my ass off, falling on my ass, figuring out why I fell on my ass. Why does my team hate me? True story. My entire engineering team hated me. You know why they hated me, Jason? They thought I was a robot. Like I had no human emotion. I just was trying to hide everything, all the uncertainty in the business. And the second I showed them vulnerability, I learned during this time that vulnerability was a strength. Um, you could build trust and rapport with other humans that worked for me. So I learned a lot. It was a lot of personal growth in this like depressing post acquisition period. And then I kind of just realized I'm a really bad retired person and I should never retire. It was the only time that I can remember in like my adult life that I wasn't working um, and I didn't need to work and objectively like didn't need to work for the rest of my life with, you know, what was happening in crypto so quickly. Um, and uh, I decided I, I got to go build my next thing. And that became Hedera. That's what's now called HBAR. It's my first unicorn, won't be my last for sure. I'm still a young guy, but um, you know, HBAR, HBAR was a, an amazing team effort. It was actually a technology founded by these two amazing computer scientists, Dr. Lehman Baird and Mance Harmon. They were you know, 20 plus years in the US Air Force uh, course directors for cybersecurity. These guys had literally built the missile defense simulation program for the United States you know, Air Force and our allies. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie War Games, like literally these guys were doing, you know, what was in War Games, what was parried in War Games. And I moved to New York at that point. I was living in Budapest, Hungary this entire time. So seven plus years in Budapest, Hungary. I moved to New York and I meet these guys four days after moving to New York. I don't even have a bed frame yet. My mattress is on the floor of my apartment and I uh, meet these guys and, uh, immediately that first day, decide to write a check. No more due diligence. These guys just have a technology. They're not generating any revenue. They're not making any money, but I trusted them and it was great. And the, the, you know, the, the, the check was contingent on them agreeing that we're going to launch a public blockchain based on this hash graph consensus algorithm. Um, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of good feelings, you know, a lot of uncertainty as well. And I just went all in. I didn't just write the check. I worked there. Um, I was, you know, number four on the team. Um, so I don't call myself a co-founder as part of the founding team. Um, and then I adopted the title. I think I was called senior vice president of global business development, a fancy title for a 27 year old without a college degree. And my job was to go to market. So didn't get paid. I carried a lot of the business expenses on my credit card. It later got paid back when the company started doing well. And uh, I got paid in HBAR. I got paid in this cryptocurrency HBAR today, HBAR and the Hedera protocol fully diluted is worth over $10 billion. So, uh, you know, it's used by Google, IBM, Boeing, Deutsche Telekom, Nomura, Tata Communications, LG Electronics, Shinhan Bank in Korea, um, you know, the University College of London. It's incredible. It's unbelievable to like, you know, see the adoption of something I built. I'm really proud of that. Um, and, uh, and, and that was fun. <laughs> 